in the, I wanted to read this. I feel this is for somebody today. Um, the, the movie, The Shack, the book, The Shack, so powerful. Dory and I have seen the movie twice already. And in the book, one of the statements that is made by the author is the presence of pain is not the absence of love. And it's a difficult statement, but we have to learn how to wrestle with it. But uh, just put this down, perhaps part of a song, but it says, just reading this, the presence of pain is not the absence of love. In our darkness shines a light from above. In our tears, a comfort is found, a deeper, higher ground, a celestial sound. In this storm, to your mercy, I am bound. There is a refuge. There is a refuge. The presence of pain is not the absence of love. In this mourning or sadness, a mercy will surely heal. In this sadness, God's promise is so real. Though my heart now is broken, your love is overflowing. Your character is growing. At last, I am knowing you are a refuge. You are a refuge, and the presence of pain is not the absence of love. Your cross is my salvation, your wisdom my contemplation, your presence a new creation from sorrow to elation. Your spirit is my glory, you are hidden in every story. We don't have to worry anymore, we won't have to worry anymore. And so I continue to learn the presence of pain is not the absence of love. In this present darkness shines a light from above. The strength you are giving, now we can rely. Though pain is still present, you overshadow the lie. And the presence of death is not the absence of life. Lord, we humble our hearts before you. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that you are the resurrected Lord. You conquered death for us because we could not endure that death. But Lord Jesus, we fix our eyes upon you. Teach us your compassion. Teach us your timing. Teach us your wisdom. Lord Jesus, for everyone prays in, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let's just lift up the, let's just pray a little prayer here. Meditate upon Jesus and his presence, his cross, his resurrection. Just speak out loud. Just speak it out loud. Lord, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes upon you, Lord Jesus. We train ourselves. We enter into the discipleship of being Christians, being a follower. I'm not ashamed to say I'm a Christian, and I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of the Messiah. I'm a follower of the Christ. I'm a follower of Emmanuel. I'm a follower of the one who is the Alpha and the Omega who is not finished with any of us yet. So, Lord, we bless you, and we thank you, Lord. Bless you. Now, turn with me, if you would, in uh, the resurrection is such a worthy subject to consider. Turn with me to this little portion. We'll see how long God takes us with this. It's called Resurrection Revelation. The Revelation of the Resurrection should challenge and shake us up, to be sure. Charles Spurgeon said, the great English preacher, most Christians live their lives as if Jesus were still dead. And I think to the, that's a, to a certain degree true of all of us. But Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, is a well-worn scripture. I like the way the NIV translates it. And then Luke 24 This is a well-worn passage, in it, but I do like the way the, the NIV puts it. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no revelation. The uh, King James Bible we're more familiar with. Where there is no vision, people perish. The King James Bible says very nicely. The uh, NIV tries to give us a, a little bit clearer picture of it and translates it more dynamically and says, where there is no revelation, 
the people will cast off restraint. That is, they will not live for God. That is, the NIV says, I mean, the King James says, where there is no vision, people will perish because they have cast off restraint. But blessed is the man or the woman who keeps or walks in the light of God's law, God's Torah, God's teaching. New Testament teaching is that Jesus rose from the dead. There's a revelation of the resurrection of Jesus. New Testament Torah, New Testament teaching emphatically states that Jesus is risen from the dead. Where there is no revelation, people will cast off restraint. Where there is no revelation that Jesus is right there with you in resurrected presence. Where there is no vision, people will perish. They will die without this revelation. Now let's fast forward to this resurrection revelation as it comes down to us in our New Testament Torah, our New Testament revelation Let's see how much of this we read. It's such an astounding chapter. The NIV, Luke 24, 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took their spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that were gleaming, gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He must be crucified, and on the third day, he will be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with whom who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what in the world is going on? Verse 13, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. Many of us are familiar with that beautiful painting, the road to Emmaus, Jesus pointing to the clouds, pointing to the kingdom of heaven. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem, probably to the northwest. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself, the resurrected Lord, came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you talking about? What are you discussing as you walk along the road? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them said, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He is a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels. Who, pardon me? But they didn't find his body, verse 23. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. But some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are. How slow of heart 
to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged Jesus strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took some of the bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and he began to give it to them. Their eyes suddenly were opened and they recognized him. And he suddenly disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? Well, he talked with us on the road. And while he opened, opened up the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon Peter. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Abba Father, we, we, we desperately hunger, our hearts hunger for this revelation for our world, for our families. Uh, Abba Father, to come into a fruition beyond our wildest dream and imagination. Lord, so we look to you now in the precious, awesome name of the resurrected Lord and Savior who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. Well, I was, my wife and I were paging through a book on uh, spiritual warfare prayers, and I came across we came across something by Tony Evans. Anybody familiar with Tony Evans? He, I believe he's a pastor in California. Pastors a very large church, and he's been through fires. He's been through wars. He's been through all kinds of things, and he is still standing. I so appreciate pastors who take a stand and don't give up. But he says, in seasoned wisdom from the heart of God, I wish I could tell you in good conscience that if you come to Jesus, it won't rain on your parade or that you will no longer have to experience difficulties, trials, delays, or other disappointing scenarios. If I could tell you that, I imagine you might shout, clap your hands, and smile big. I would too. But I can't tell you that simply because it's not true. Yet what I can tell you ought to paint a smile on your face because when you and I grasp this, it will change the way you view life's plan. Here it is. How many of you want to hear what Tony Evans says? All ears listening? Here it is. God will never allow anything in your life that he does not simultaneously, two things at the same time going on, that he does not simultaneously promise to use for good if you are one of his children and living according to his purpose. How many of you know Romans 8, 28? God will cause all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We need this resurrection revelation continuously. We all need it. Our families need it. The church on the North Shore needs it. The Jewish community needs it. We need this revelation that God is alive and well and working in and through every circumstance. And how many of you believe it intellectually? How many of you know your emotions don't always buy it? Sometimes your emotions don't buy it because it's just too painful. And you have conflict. You're, we're conflicted in our minds. Can God really take this unbelievable, horrendous nightmare? If you review The Shack, the movie The Shack, the unbelievable scenario of heart-wrenching pain beyond comprehension when his little girl is abducted and abused and dies. 
Where do you go with that in your mind and your thinking? Where do you go with that kind of thing? You simply uh, receive a Bible passage and think that that's going to suddenly change you? It's heart-wrenching beyond comprehension. Losing a loved one is one of the most difficult things that any of us do experience. But Charles Spurgeon, that great English preacher, said that most of us as Christians live our lives as if Jesus were still dead. And I believe that's part of what he's talking about, is that we don't really fully buy the reality that God can take every situation and turn it around for good because our emotions speak louder than the biblical truth that sometimes is speaking softly and whispering to us. But this resurrection revelation, I love stuff. I, I get so encouraged and I get so blessed and it's, it's okay, okay, Lord. Yesterday I was utterly convinced that there could be only one person here. And as I was preparing this message, I said, Dear Jesus, let the one person that comes be blessed with this message. And the presence of God just enveloped me and encircled me. So look at how many people are here. There's nine, and I thought there was going to be one. Nine times what I was expecting. But the Lord is here, too. He's always here. And uh, Jeremy Sinnott, remember Jeremy Sinnott of uh, Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship? He wrote a book called The, the Audience of One. He's a worship leader the powerful re renewal that were, was going on up at Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. In his book titled, The Audience of One, meant he was willing to lead worship, and if Jesus was the only one there, that was enough for him. And he locked that into his mind. And that was what God was training him with, to understand that the audience of one is a majority. But I, I love this uh, picture of the angels. How many of you... I wish Teresa were here. Teresa has seen angels, of course. Some of you perhaps have seen angels. Has anyone seen the image of an angel in some shape, manner, or form, either in private or in a worship service, where you start to sense a presence and it starts to manifest a little bit, and then it starts to get uh, more transparent again. You can't see it, but then there are other times when it starts to radiate, and the radiation of the holy angelic presence starts to become more manifest. We have to pray that for people to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that that happens. And Paul says, I keep asking the glorious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that you will have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, those two coming together to know, to have wisdom, what to do with a revelation that comes from the throne of God. But there's powerful revelation that comes here. God sends these holy angels that are accustomed to God's presence. And if you're accustomed to God's presence, like the seraphim of Isaiah chapter 6, it says the seraphim, and the Hebrew word for a seraphim, sharaf, means to burn with fire. And uh, these angels are surrounding the throne of God, and they go night and day, holy, 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 kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And these angelic beings begin to become more and more like God in the fiery presence of the throne of God. And I believe these angels have come from the very throne of God. It says in Luke 24, 4, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning. There was a radiation of heavenly glory. How many of you have ever seen lightning come from the sky that just shakes the earth? The scripture says in Psalm 104, verse 4, he makes wind, winds his messengers, flames of fire, his servants. These angelic beings have the essence of an angel. They are angels. They have the essence of the very heart and the throne of God. It's, it's a powerful, powerful revelation. And they come with a word. He has risen from the dead. Remember, 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 God will come. Precious memory. Too many of us have spiritual Alzheimer's. It's a tragedy to see people die of Alzheimer's. 
one dear woman in our church who this pulpit is dedicated to. One of the saddest moments in 30 years of pastoral ministry was to see her life slowly ebbing away with Alzheimer's. But it's also very heartbreaking for me as a pastor to see men and women with spiritual Alzheimer's. They forget God's word. They forget what God has said to them. They forget the revelation that they once received, and they are now walking without revelation. The angel says, remember, remember, oh, precious memory. Oh, God, help me to remember. Don't let me lethargically slip into spiritual Alzheimer's. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He must be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Turn back to Luke chapter 18, 31. It's exactly what Jesus would say this again and again to his disciples. Here's one of them. Luke 18, 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and he told them, Taking them aside, it was something that was of grave importance for them to know. We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man, that is literally Ben Adam, Ben, the Hebrew word for son, the word for man is Adam. Jesus, one of his favorite sayings about himself is that he is the son of Adam, just like Adam, but yet without sin. He is the obedient one. The Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Did Jesus know exactly what was going to happen to him? Did the disciples grasp it? I believe Jesus did understand exactly what was going to happen to him. It's right there. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. What does that mean? Suffering and death, rejection and death, and also resurrection. It's spelled out right there. Jesus knew it was happening. That's why the angels said, remember, he told you while he was still with you, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. He must be. It's the plan of God. It's the salvation for sinners. A lamb could deliver us. Behold the lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Well, that's the first revelation of the resurrection that comes through the angels. Now they're about to receive revelation of Jesus himself, incognito, if you will. That is, they are kept from recognizing him. Look what it says. We read it out loud. We read this glorious chapter, the entirety of the chapter out loud. As they talked, verse 15 of Luke 24, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Why, why is that? Why do you think that is? They were kept. Now, there's a little bit of what in Hebrew we call here the divine passive. They were prevented from seeing. But there's also something else going on here. Not only is there a little bit of the divine passive, that God, God is acting to keep them in the dark about this situation. They have an inability to grasp what's going on and understand and apply biblical truth. But also, they are downcast, the, the biblical text says. They are downcast. They are struggling to believe what is really going on. So there's a combination of things here. They're filled with despair. They're filled with confusion. They don't understand God's wisdom. They don't understand God's plan. So it twists their souls and it creates a blindness, an inability to see what God is up to, an inability to see that the resurrected Lord is right there with them. Part of the challenge that Dory and I have after 30 years of ministry 
is remembering the glorious ways that God has always delivered us over and over and over again. And it's important to see how uh, he brought us out here. Uh, it was one miraculous provision after another miraculous provision. And then there was this unique couple that came and followed us. They were out here about six weeks, two months after we were. A lovely couple whose names I, I, I will not share with you. And I, I do remember their names. Thank you, Lord. But they came out here, and they were graduates of Gordon-Conwell, uh, excuse me, North Central Bible College like we were. And they saw how God had opened the doors for us. And they saw how we were living on the ocean and uh, scholarship and all these open doors. And they came out here, and nothing worked. Nothing worked for them. They struggled big time. And inside of six months, their marriage was dissolved. I still remember the, our dear brother, Dr. Joel Krugel, uh, a pastor before myself. He had a, a number of people lined up at the end of a service. And m my dear friend, who had just lost his wife, fellow graduate of North Central Bible College, Spirit-filled Bible College, was going up to the altar with the tears coming down his eyes, and he's wailing out loud, wailing, because he's in trauma. He's lost his wife. His wife has left him. He came out to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in fulfillment of a dream, and everything has backfired. Everything. It's a tragedy. Could I walk up to him and say, cheer up, brother, Jesus is risen from the dead? Well, if he is risen from the dead, then why this tragedy? Why this sorrow? And we really haven't heard from either of them for a long time. We prayed for them many, 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 many times. And Jeff took a couple of years at, there's his first name, so sorry about that. I, he, it was a couple of years at Gordon Conwell and then transferred. Never heard from his wife again. But dear brothers and sisters, there are many, many who are suffering through brokenness and suffering through difficulties who need wisdom and compassion and who need to walk through the valley of sorrow and, and be underlined by the Lord and say the presence of pain is not the absence of love. The Lord will be with you in your suffering and your sorrow. He will be with you. He will walk with you. He will never leave you. He will never, never, never forsake you. But Jesus says to these disciples, who, uh, there's a, just a, a little bit of a chastisement here coming. You have to be honest with the language. Jesus says, if you pick it up, the uh, this scenario in verse 25, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah, of course the NIV says the Christ, they're one and the same, Messiah, Christ, anointed one, whether you use the English understanding or the Hebrew understanding, Mashiach, someone who is anointed by God. How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? He's just underlining, underlining, highlighting again that the Messiah had to come and suffer and die. And their eyes were needing to be opened. And that is what is about to happen. But Jesus underlines that Moses and the prophets he explained to them what is said in the scriptures concerning himself. And they said later, remember as he walked with us on the way, how our hearts burned within us. How many of you have ever been reading scripture or you've heard a message somewhere and the fire of the spirit of God would burn in your soul. How many of you have ever been worshiping the Lord and you came to church that day feeling so lethargic and so fixated on worries and fears but suddenly the Holy Spirit comes and you sense the fiery presence of God burning away the lethargy and burning away the depression and the despair and you open your hearts up and say, more of you, Lord, more of you. Thank you for reminding me of your love. 
But as they walked with him along the way and they stopped at a type of an inn of some kind, verse 30 says, when he was at the table with them, unique scenario, a revelation is about to come. He broke bread, of course, flashing back to the Passover Seder, flashing back to the Lord's table. And he began to give it to them. And then in those moments, it says, flash. Then their eyes were opened. Again, it's a divine passive. Something happens to them. It's not that they are making it happen. Something happens to them. It's called the divine passive. Passive. Their eyes were opened. That means somebody's opening their eyes. And their eyes were closed. I, I frequently use the story of my cataracts. You know, the doctor op- has got my eyes open wide, and he says, it's just going to hurt for a moment. It's just going to be a little pinch, and boom. And he pulls off this nasty cataract that had been growing on my eyes. And for weeks, I was like, oh, <laughs> brilliant light all around I had to wear these goggles. Remember the day we went to Century House, the day after the surgery? And I had the big thing on the one eye, and uh, I looked like a monster, but I still have that picture. We wanted to take the picture so that I wouldn't forget those moments and the brilliant light that was all around. But brothers and sisters, God wants us to participate. This is one of my favorite passages, and so I don't forget, God brings me back to these kinds of Passages, keep your marker there in Luke 24. But look at Ephesians. I believe God wants us to participate. I believe Paul's, the Apostle Paul is a good example. Uh, Paul says to Christians now, to the Ephesian Christians, he, he says, I keep asking. What, what, what does that mean, I keep asking? Do you have to be a Greek scholar? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. I keep asking, what if you send me an email and you don't get a response immediately from me? What do you do? Do you give up? If Michael Helen sends me a text and I don't get back to him in 24 or 48 hours, start panicking, right? You just keep on. Send another email. Send an email. Send a text. You just keep on doing it until you get an answer because you need to know something. You say that that Pastor Scott, he's always slow to re- respond to my texts. He's really slow all the time or something of that nature. But you're driven to make sure you get the answer that you want because you need to know. That's what Paul is doing here. I keep asking. I keep asking. Paul had a revelation of Jesus on the Damascus Road. Otherwise, his life would have been hell bound, and that's where he would have ended up. The Apostle Paul desperately needed a revelation, so he takes that revelation, that understanding, and he starts crying out, God, I keep asking you, the glorious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may give you the spirit, or anointing, the spiritual dimension, the ruach, that he will give you the spirit of wisdom in revelation. If there's anyone who needs wisdom, it's a person who's had a revelation. If you get a revelation, you need a lot of wisdom to know how to do it. Dory and I were watching uh, uh, on the internet a a guy who was uh, flatlined, heart attack or something of that nature, and he went to heaven, and he wasn't living for the Lord. And believe you me, it shook his life up big time. But he comes back and is like, now all of a sudden he, he's got a, a ministry to the world to change the world. And he's saying, I'm not really a Christian, but I'm a follower of the Messiah. And I say, oh, that's very, very confusing language. And everything he was saying ha- had this confusion to it. He needed a little time to think through. He needed somebody to sit down with him to help him walk through some of these things. He needed wisdom because he had an incredible revelation. Thank you, Jesus. I don't doubt the revelation at all, but he needs somebody to disciple him and sit down and say, you have been given a tremendous gift. Now be wise in how you use this gift. Not everyone is going to... How many of you uh, want a flat line out in the parking lot today? Have a sudden heart attack and go into heavenly glory. You want to line up the nine of us? (laughs) A 
that could start a, a great book ministry for you, an uh, online ministry. Um, people will either think you're a total nutcase or they'll line up to uh, hear your story, you know. But we can pray that people will have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord. That is to know him better, know who he is. And I also pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Think of your heart as having eyes. And enlightening, Paul below writes, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. But this is where he gets this, the beautiful, beautiful, awesome song that went viral, went all around the world. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope. Thank you for living hope through the resurrection to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. No wonder Paul Belo says, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the throne room of God. God has placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed Jesus to be head over everything for the ecclesia, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Paul's at a loss of words because of the revelation that he's received. But Jesus is recognized by them, their eyes are open when he breaks bread. The obvious pointing of the finger to the Passover lamb revelation that comes to the disciples. And I, lo- I like to call it the, the burning heart Bible study. I believe we as Christians need to medi- not only memorize scripture, but meditate upon scripture, that scripture is like a seed. It needs to grow in us, develop roots in us, because the opposite is true of satanic things. Satan sows his seed of terrible experiences. Satan sows his seed and he magnifies it and manifests it over and over and over. And all the, we carry wounds from generations. We carry wounds from terrible, terrible ordeals that we've gone through in our lives. And these experiences become like bad seed that go into our souls and they start to consume the heart. They start to consume the soul and cause poisonous cancer in our, in our bodies. And I believe that in part it causes spiritual Alzheimer's, that these painful experiences that we have overshadow the truth of God's love. But the seed of God's word, the, the Holy Spirit's power and presence comes and the word of God begins to kick out all of the negativity, all of the pain, all of the sorrow. So for so many, self-hatred, I know what I did. I know the mistake that I made, and I cannot forgive myself. That wouldn't be righteous to forgive myself. But in the Bible, a righteousness from God is revealed. But I love what it says here. Jesus didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How many of you realize He didn't carry a small pocket promise Bible in his back pocket. Where did Jesus get all this information from? He had meditated upon the word of God. It was not simply scripture memory. It was scripture vitality in his soul. When when Satan came up against him, he even quoted Psalm 91 inappropriately. It, It was fine, quote, but it was a wrong passage at the wrong time. Jesus knew the word of God. He was the word of God. But I was meditating on this last night and thinking, uh, look at what it says in Luke 24, a little bit further. 
in the next section, Luke 24, 44. He said to the disciples, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. And look at these three sections, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's the Tanakh. That's what we call the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketavim. That is the three sections of the Hebrew Bible. Jesus knew the Hebrew Bible. He knew the Torah. The law. What is the law of Moses? Anybody know? It's, of course, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. How many of you know the first five books of the Bible? Okay, let's say them nice and loud. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, elementary, my dear Watson, right? You all know that, no problem. Okay, what's the next three books? Yes, yeah, nice little, you hope Joshua doesn't judge Ruth, but in case he does, there it is for you to put it in your long-term memory. Joshua judges, I, I can't tell you how many times I use that to find, where's Joshua again? I lost that book. Where is it? Oh, yeah, Joshua judges Ruth. Oh, yeah, there it is. Go, <laughs> Go back and find it. Where's that book of Ruth again? I thought it was by Nehemiah. No, it ain't by Nehemiah. It's Joshua judges Ruth. Oh, yeah, there we go. Let's go find Ruth. <laughs> oh, thank oh, precious memory. But this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything. And then I started walking through the Bible. How about in, in Genesis chapter 28? Uh, turn there real quick with me. Genesis, the first book of the Bible. I believe Jesus referred to this because he was talking to Nathaniel about the stairway to heaven. And he begins to go through the scriptures with him. It's, is it, uh, yeah, it's 28. Look at uh, Genesis 28. I am with you, and I will watch over you. The scenario here is fantastic. It's unbelievable. Uh, Jacob is running from his family. He's in desperate straits. He, he's in ter he uses a stone, a rock for a pillow. And it says in verse 15 of Genesis 28, I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. It's exactly what Jesus says. I will be with you to the end of the age. I will never leave you nor forsake you. In verse 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep by the power of the dream, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. Underline that for yourself. Jesus is in this place with you and you are not usually aware of it. Jacob has an awakening moment and he says, the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. I didn't know it. The resurrected Lord there in the book of Genesis was there with him. I believe that was part of Jesus' Bible study. And Jacob says, how awesome is this place. Now, I would just adjust that, Mr. Jacob, and say how awesome is the Lord who made this place an awesome place. But that, that forgive me, Jacob, forgive me. How awesome is the Lord in this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gateway of heaven. Jesus talks about it in the book of John. How about Exodus? Exodus chapter 12, the Passover lamb. How about Leviticus chapter 16, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur? That's one of the greatest chapters in the Hebrew Bible. How about Numbers 21, 8 and 9, where Jesus says in John 3, 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's right from Numbers 21, 8 and 9. Uh, there, there's the uh, books of the Bible there. How about Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24, the Holy Trinity of David's Psalms. Psalm 22, Jesus quotes and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 23, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus makes Psalm 23 his guide for who he is. How about Psalm 24? Who is the king of glory? He is mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. How about the prophets, Isaiah chapter 53? He is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. How about in Jeremiah 17, 10, where the word of the Lord comes and says, I am the Lord. I search the heart and I examine the mind. 
Jesus says the same thing in Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, that is spoken in Jeremiah 17, 10. How about in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. That is a picture of Jesus. The, right from the book of lament, right in the book of weeping and crying and mourning. How about Ezekiel 47, verse 9? He is the source of the living water. So wherever the river flows, everything will live. Wherever the Holy Spirit goes, everything is going to live. Jesus says, I am the living water. I am. Come to me, all of you who are weary and thirsty, and I will give you rest. He is Jonah. Jonah, as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be for this generation. Luke 11.30. Jonah is the sign. Oh, we could go on. Jesus is there in the law of Moses. He is there in the scriptures. He is there in the Psalms. He is there in the prophets. He is the revelation of the word of God. He will never leave you. He will never leave me. He will never forsake us. He will open the eyes of your loved ones to see. Just don't give up. Keep on asking him. Keep on asking him. Weary the Lord's. Don't give up asking the Lord. He will give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation just as sure as he did us in his great love and his mercy. And he will return again as he said. I love the song that we sing. Another Paul Belosh song. Thank you, Jesus, for Paul Belosh. You lived, you died, you said in three days you would rise. You did. You're alive. You rule and you reign. You said you're coming back again. I know you will. It's pretty logical, right? It's just, in all the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. Lord, we humble our hearts before you. And thank you, Lord, that you are the word. You are the living word of God, Lord. We've just barely begun to touch the surface. So, Lord, we thank you, Abba. Thank you, Abba. Lord, we want to continue to uh, lift up our loved ones before you. Thank you, Lord, for your great love, your great faithfulness, Lord. We magnify your awesome holy name. We magnify your awesome holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. I'm just going to worship team. I just want you to take a break from having to be up here. And we just want to do open the eyes of my heart. Open up the altars. You can go in the direction that God has for you. And trust and believe the Lord together. Lord, we know the service is now over, so we just offer our lives to you. Some of us have plans and places we've got to be, people we've got to meet with. So, Lord, we just commit it all into your hands. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's lift him up. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the 
eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, 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 to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, 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 join with this seraphim of heaven, become fire, become fire for the Lord. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Holy, 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 Jesus, holy, 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 risen, holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Holy, 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 Jesus, holy, 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 Savior, holy, 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 I want to see you. You are risen from the dead, forever with us. Holy, 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 Jesus, holy, 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 Savior, holy, 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 I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Holy, 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 Lord, you are holy, 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 I want to see you. As you're also hungering for the Lord. Let's, let's close with uh, you lived and you died. Paul, if you have the lyrics handy for that, let's all stand. Anyone can join me if you, you want to. Feel free. It's up to you. Go in the direction that God has for you. You did, you're alive. You rule, you reign. You said you're coming back again. I know you will, and all the earth will sing your praises. And all the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. You live, you died. You said in three days you would rise. You did, you're alive. You rule, you reign. You said you're coming back again. I know. You will, and all the earth will sing your praises. 
all the earth will sing your praises. And all the earth will sing your praises. You took, you take our sins away, O oh God. You give, you gave your life away for us. You came down, you saved us through the cross. Our hearts are changed because of your great love. You lived, you died, you said in three days you would rise. You did, you're alive. He is risen. You rule and you reign. You said you're coming back again. I know you will. All the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. And all the earth will sing your praises. You took, you take our sins away, oh God, right now. You give, you gave your life away for us. You came down, you saved us through the cross. Our hearts are changed because of your great love. You live, you die, you said in three days you would rise. You did, you're alive. You rule, Lord. You rule and you reign. You said you're coming back again. I know you will, and all the earth will sing your praises. 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 Yes, Lord, we clap our hands. Clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Great is the Lord. Faithful are you, O God. The presence of any pain is not to be interpreted as the absence of love. But even more so, Lord, you reveal yourself in the midst of our trials. In Jesus' name. Amen. God is good, and you guys are really cool for being here. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. If anyone uh, wants the spirit of wisdom and revelation, I saw one translation say it's uh, the anointing, a spirit, a, a Holy Spirit blessing that comes. I have a bottle of oil here. Anoint you. Mm -hmm. 